Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today we're going to take a look at the high seas, the oceans, and some of the challenges that are confronting them, especially as we see the ravages of climate change taking place. My guest is an expert in this area. Liz Karen is the Project Director of Protecting Ocean Life on the High Seas, and she's with the Pew Charitable Trust. Liz, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you, Bill, pleasure to be here. I appreciate you being with me today. Let's, we're gonna get into the high seas or on the high seas in a moment, but what is the Pew Charitable Trust? What, uh, what is your main mission? Sure, the Pew Charitable Trust is an international nonprofit organization that is really working to advance civic public policies um, for the betterment of mankind. So whether it's on um, social policies, fiscal policies, mm -hmm. government reform, and also on environment. Mm -hmm. Now you're the director of the project Ocean Life on the High Seas with the Pew Charitable Trust. What, what, what is your main function and what is the function of that program? Sure, um, so my fun uh, the function of the program is really to help the United Nations, parties to the United Nations, develop a new legally binding agreement, a new treaty um, for the conservation and protection of marine biodiversity mm -hmm. on the high seas, which makes up two thirds of the world's oceans. Um, our program sits within a broader program at Pew that's really working on um, protecting our oceans in general. Mm -hmm. When we say the high seas, are we talking about beyond the, uh, the limit, like a 200 mile limit, or how do you define the high seas? Yeah, great question. So the high seas is basically, as you said, everything beyond the 200 nautical mile limit from the um, a country's coast, 200 miles out is their national waters. Beyond that is the high seas. And so what people don't realize is that most of the world's oceans are actually the high seas, actually two thirds of the world's oceans. Mm -hmm. Which is a pretty broad expanse there. <laughs> it sure very is. Expansive. It sure is. And that part of the ocean actually doesn't have any comprehensive conservation governance. And so mm -hmm. that's what this treaty is trying to, to address. Mm -hmm. Somebody said the other day, I don't know, it wasn't in your conference, somebody with whom I was speaking said, the high seas is almost like the Wild West. There are no laws or whatever. People do what they want to do when they really shouldn't in some cases. Is, is it that bad or? <laughs> well, it's, it's not quite that not bad. bad. Okay. Close, <laughs> um, but not it does, quite. It, I mean, the high seas does evoke imagery of pirates, but um, mm -hmm. really in reality, there are actually at least 20 organizations that cover and have some mandate of regulation over some port of the part of the high seas. Um, mostly it's fisheries organizations, um, but also uh, the International Maritime Organization um, that regulates shipping and the International Seabed Authority that is, um, will be regulating or uh, emerging activities mm -hmm. like seabed mining. And that came under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea Treaty. So the all of those activities, ISA. yeah, all of those mm -hmm. activities come under the UN um, right. Convention on the Law of the Sea. Right. Yeah. Now you've been in New York for at least a week at this high level conference. What, uh, what was the purpose, you've alluded to it a little bit, but what was the purpose and what came out of the conference? It's just about to wrap up. So this is the third negotiating session of um, an intergovernmental conference, so an inter uh, intergovernmental negotiating sessions where countries from all over the world are really working to try hammer out final text of a new treaty um, for the protection of the high seas. And uh, this is the th third negotiating session, so there have been two prior. Um, this process kicked off in 2018, and is the, the final meeting is going to be in 2020. Um, what came out of these two weeks is really delegates, um, negotiators looking at draft treaty text and trying to find uh, areas of agreement for a pathway forward. Mm -hmm. Are they moving in that direction? Is it look promising or <laughs> any time you get all these people together to hammer this out, it's, it's very confusing and it's very complicated, yes. really very complex. But are they moving forward on it? Yes, um, yes, it is a really complicated issue. It's a package of issues that are being negotiated. It's not just about um, marine protected areas in the high seas, mm -hmm. um, but it's also about uh, making sure that there are good environmental impact assessments of new activity and emerging activities that are going to be happening in the high seas. It's also about building capacity and, and ensuring tech transfer for developing countries to be able to implement their responsibilities um, for conservation under this, uh, under this new treaty. And it's also about um, access to and benefit sharing from marine genetic resources. So it's a big package, a lot of complicated mm -hmm. issues. Um, and the countries are taking it seriously. It's a little slow, felt a little slow going at times this week, but now that we're coming to the fi uh, final day, uh, um, after the final day, um, it really f feels like there's good momentum going into the next meeting. Mm -hmm. what, what defines a marine protected area? How do you designate that? The, all of the high seas is not a marine protected area, I guess. Is it or is it? I, I, may, <laughs> I may be wrong on that. I'm a novice in this area. But how, what are the criteria maybe that you use to identify 
the MPA? Sure. So um, marine protected areas are a common conservation tool that countries use within their own waters. Um, so within the United States, we have the uh, Papahanaumokuakea uh, Marine Protected Area out around the islands of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, other countries have um, protected areas. Chile, for instance, um, recently announced a, a protected area around its Easter Island um, so uh, to conserve the fisheries around there so, uh, and protect the marine biodiversity as well. And so, um, and different nations have different criteria, different standards, um, different laws and regulations to put those in place. Uh, what we're trying to do is um, internationalize that process, bring it into uh, and create a standards for, for uh, as you say, identification uh, process um, and making sure that it's science-based uh, and a standard to make sure that um, those marine protected areas are actually doing what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And one of the most unique and really fragile ecosystems, I guess you would call it, in the world is the Galapagos Islands. Mm -hmm. Is Ecuador participating in this also? Do they have a, a marine protected area around the Galapagos? Um, so, the mar uh, yeah, they have some marine protections around their, the Galapagos Islands. Uh, mostly it's within the territorial waters. Um, so, um, and Ecuador is, of course, participating in these negotiations, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. I'm glad. <laughs> That's very good. Well, what, what are some of the main problems that are on the high seas today? We, we hear so much about, uh, I, I, I've probably heard 5,000 times, I'm exaggerating <laughs> a bit, about by 2050 there will be more plastic weight-wise in the ocean than fish if we keep going the way we're going. And so I think there are like five gyres, are there not, around the world where these currents come together and you have these huge miles and kilometers of nothing but floating plastic. But I'm assuming that's one of the main problems, but are there other problems or that we're confronting on the high seas? Yeah, um, so plastics and other land-based pollution is definitely a problem in the high seas. I think for too long, um, society has uh, you know, accepted the mantra that the solution to pollution is dilution, and <laughs> we're seeing really that that's not the case anymore. Um, but other things that are really stressors on the high seas are overfishing, um, uh, noise pollution is emerging as a, a and the science there is emerging that that's increasingly having impacts, especially on marine mammals, um, shipping uh, incidents with ship strikes of marine mammals, but also waste coming from ships um, that are uh, bilging mm -hmm. uh, oil or wastewater over uh, you know th in their shipping practices. Um, emerging practices like seabed mining have will have the potential to um, create huge impacts on the seabed floor and the, the rich marine biodiversity that's down there um, and the impacts of which we really don't know and haven't really explored and yet that activity seems to be um, moving forward quite quickly. Mm -hmm. And we mentioned earlier about the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea Treaty. That was one that was worked on for several years, um, perhaps decades. I know it pretty much came online around 1982 or something like mm -hmm. that. Just in general terms, how important is that convention for what you're doing and for other aspects too. Yeah, so if it wasn't for the Law of the Sea Convention, um, this negotiation wouldn't be going on. And the Law of the Sea is very much the, the parent organization or the parent treaty under which um, this, uh, which and under UNCLOS, there's a recognition and obligation for states to be protecting and conserving the marine environment. And this treaty is really a way for uh, states to be uh, elaborating on what that means because it's really just a very short um, part of UNCLOS, which is, depending on what, uh, what version you print out, somewhere between 50 and 100 pages. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> um, yeah, it's quite <laughs> a long document. That's the overview. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. um, and so the, the purpose of these negotiations is really to expand upon with what we know now, many decades later, about the stressors on the marine environment and, and the needs to protect it. And, and this is writing the rule book of how that would happen. Mm -hmm. And you were talking about the ships. I know the, uh, well, there's a United Nations Agency, the International Maritime Organization, is very involved in working with the shipping companies around the world, the shipping lines, to develop rules and regulations so that they try to control this and don't pollute the oceans. And it's a full-time job, I'm sure, with all the ships that are out there, they're carrying oil and what have you, fossil fuels, coal, whatever the case might be, passengers, even the, the, uh, the ecotourism folks, I'm sure, want to uh, try to be uh, leave a small negative footprint on the on the ocean as possible. But it, it's something we have to work on together, without a doubt. What, uh, as you move forward on this, what do you see as your major challenge? 
So, I mean, the major challenge is, is that, you know, and um, as you said with the International Maritime Organization, um, there are some organizations that have rules in place that can protect, mm -hmm. um, you know, the activity or help um, preserve and, and minimize their impact on the environment within their sector. But there really is no comprehensive um, management tool to ensure that marine biodiversity is protected or, or sustainably used. And really, that's what this treaty is trying to create. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the biggest challenge facing um, this process is, I think, just in, in some ways public awareness, people understanding, I think, but that's changing now because people are really starting to understand the threats that are facing the oceans, what's at risk if we don't act now, especially in light of climate change. Um, mm -hmm. The climate change is already changing our oceans with ocean acidification, um, sea, ri sea level rise, uh, sea temperature rise, and this is having um, already an impact in a lot of um, the world's oceans. and. Uh, fisheries are seeing impacts where fish, fish are starting to be found, uh, you know, not found where they were traditionally mm -hmm. found and are migrating further north uh, or south, depending, um, toward the poles. Um, and so, you know, this agreement won't necessarily stop climate change, but it can create islands and reserves, areas of protection um, that will feel mi that uh, won't be otherwise um, stressed by such um, active human activity. Mm -hmm. And so often we, we forget, or maybe we just don't know, or, or we're hearing about it now, but it's really frightening, we, especially l when the oceans start to warm. We see right now that there are hurricane, uh, hurricane is bearing, barreling into Florida, and of course we saw Sandy uh, on the uh, east coast not too many years ago, Katrina, see cyclones in the Philippines, but just a small warming, the ocean can create the right conditions for even stronger storms, can, can they not? Um, Yes, that seems right from what I'm aware of. I mean, I think that we, you know, the oceans is so vital to what, um, to our life on land and, uh, the, you know, the connections really, you know, we have these political boundaries that we were talking about earlier, the exclusive economic zone for the national waters, but nature, species, sharks, tuna, turtles, <coughs> whales, they don't know where the boundaries are, so they, they <laughs> <laughs> they'll right. swim in, a, in and out of them. Um, uh, and you know, we really are the <coughs> blue planet, you know, as we've seen from pictures from space, most of the world um, uh, is actually covered by oceans. Um, scientists have recently come out with um, saying that every second breath you take actually comes from the oceans. So the oceans are as important or more important than even like the Amazon rainforest, mm -hmm. which is in an unfortunate state right now. Yes, as well. it certainly is. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with the PBS or Community Access Television Station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or you just have a computer, a website, you like our shows and you like to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided as a public service at no cost to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today we're taking a look at the high seas and many of the problems that are affecting uh, that area of the world, a very vital area of the world, and what's being done to try to protect them. My guest is an expert in this area. Liz Karen is the project director of the Protecting Ocean Life on the High Seas with the Pew Charitable Trust. Liz, we're talking about the high seas. You mentioned the exclusive ex economic zone, yep. EEZ. Yep. Make it short here. <laughs> yes. right. And that was part of the, the uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea Treaty. Not to go into great detail, but what exactly is that e EEZ? Is that like the 200 mile limit or that any country, any maritime country has as you move out or is there more to it than that? Um, so basically that's exactly as you state, so just as on land countries have borders, the UN uh, Convention on the Law of the Sea established mm -hmm. maritime borders for countries, basically to try to prevent conflict and ensure that certain countries, special, uh, especially coastal countries, knew that they had uh, exclusive rights to, for activities and management and protected areas um, within their national waters, which are now defined under the Law of the Sea as the 200 nautical miles from the coastline. Mm -hmm. Now, the uh, term we've been hearing a lot about, especially since 2015, are the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that you have a Sustainable Development Goal pen, yeah. I believe, yep. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. And, and that, uh, of course, those are the 17 logical practical goals developed by the United Nations that will run from 2016 to 2030. Which of the goals do you focus on? Uh, I'm sure 
they're probably all important to you, but which of the two, one or two, tie into your area? Sure. Um, so I actually got this pin at the UN Ocean Conference, which, ha which hap uh, took place here in New York in June mm -hmm. 2020. Um, so the Sustainable Development Goal 14 um, really focuses in on the problems of um, the world's oceans and fisheries, uh, and also marine and coastal areas. And so within that, there are a couple of points and commitments that governments made. Um, one, to protect at least 10% mm -hmm. of the uh, coastal marine areas, the world's oceans by 2010. Um, and then second, also to develop this treaty that um, we're negotiating, we've been negotiating, uh, we states have been negotiating the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. With your input. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as uh, much as they'll take it. As much as they'll take it, right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. There's a matter of sovereignty involved, yes. I guess, without a doubt. Well, you're, you're also the project director for the, for the high seas programs with uh, the Pew Trust, and you deal with other areas too. Uh, one that I noticed is aquaculture reform. What, what exactly is aquaculture reform? Sure, so aquaculture, um, uh, mostly at this pl point takes place within coastal areas um, and oftentimes, and the most commonly uh, farmed fish uh, that we were focusing on, there's freshwater mm -hmm. fish and then there's saltwater fish and uh, for the saltwater fish, it's salmon. Um, and the inputs that you need to put in to make a, uh, uh, to make a economically viable salmon farming model um, uh, it's actually, there's a lot of um, antibiotics that go into that, a lot of um, f uh, other kinds of um, fungicides and pesticides mm -hmm. um, to keep, uh, and, and also the inputs, because those are fish that eat other fish. So basically, um, part of the business model is fishing the smaller fish to feed bigger fish to feed people. Um, and as far as from a food sustainability um, point of view, uh, if you're feeding more fish to the fish than you are to the people, <laughs> from a protein <laughs> point, um, that's, that's not the best uh, uh, maybe use of the world's resources. Um, the problems there too are the sort of the inputs, the pesticides, um, antibiotics, et cetera, that you're putting into the water don't stay in a closed pen because the <laughs> fish are actually in netted pens. And so that bleeds out and actually affects a lot of the ocean life around it, other fish um, that fishermen and, and people, coastal people depend on for their livelihoods. Um, and what we're concerned about on the high seas is that they could take this model and put it out in the high seas as well. Um, already some countries and, and uh, companies are looking into tuna ranching, for instance, um, on the, uh, mm -hmm. in open waters. Um, and that's, um, and these, these are the kinds of activities that we want to make sure that if they are going to go forward, they have robust environmental impact assessments on the high seas so that any impacts or, you know, that people are really looking at what are the, the potential impacts um, of these activities on marine biodiversity um, ensuring that there's no negative harm. Mm -hmm. You mentioned tuna ranching. Uh, would, they, would these tuna be in, not in an enclosed area, obviously, if you'd have uh, a sort of a, a loose rope fence around them or something <laughs> like that? How, how would you do that? <laughs> well, um, I think they're really trying to figure out how to do that in a in an economically viable way, because um, tuna, as you know, are, may know, are really big fish and mm -hmm. really strong and swim very fast. Um, what they've found is even with sort of nets and pens, tunas can jump pretty high, so they can jump <laughs> over them as well. <laughs> right over the top. So, so there have yeah. been different models that they've been working on. Um, but uh, you know, as you know, uh, probably know, bluefin tuna is quite a luxury in some areas, mm -hmm. especially with the sushi market. I mean, if you have a bluefin, you know, one bluefin tuna, tuna can go for, you know a million dollars or more. So there's really? a lot of economic incentive to try to figure out how to make that mm -hmm. business model work. Um, and you know, our concern is that if, it re if they find a place, a time when it can work and work, um, we want to make sure that uh, it also works well for the environment. Mm -hmm. And to do it in an ecologically sound way to, to be able to do this. Okay. And uh, the experts or the aquaculture folks mm -hmm. have said for years that since we're overfishing in just about every place in the ocean, I would imagine the seas, whatever, the, that we're going to have to depend more and more on fish that are produced in an aquaculture arrangement it, because uh, by 2050, uh, the oceans may be in a very sad state of affairs as far as being able to produce enough feet, uh, f food to feed people, especially the 9.5 billion that are supposed to be here by 2050 on planet Earth. So this is a critical area. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, the last State of the Oceans report that was released by the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, um, show that overfishing is on the increase. And so it's, incre it's increasingly a problem. And catches mm -hmm. in some areas are declining. Um, the problem with aquaculture being the solution is it depends on what you feed the fish. Because if you're feeding the fish more fish, or if you're fishing fi fish to feed bigger fish, 
um, you're not actually solving the overfishing problem or ensuring mm -hmm. that there's sustainability of those world's fisheries. Um, you're actually making the problem worse. You're just uh, depleting the stock in one area <laughs> to feed, the <laughs> to increase the stock in another area. Exactly. Well, one an another thing we've seen for many years has been the sh uh, finning mm -hmm. of sharks, yes. which is really uh, sad to me, in my, in my opinion anyway, to watch it and to see these poor animals just have the fins cut off and then they're just flopping around. They can't, they won't, they're not going to live. And in many cases, they don't harvest them to, for food or anything like that. How serious is that problem today and what's being done to try to rectify it? Um, it's still, unfortunately, a continuing, t continuing problem. Um, you know, increase of, of exotic delicacies like shark fin soup being on the rise um, uh, contributes and exacerbates this problem. Um, so actually one of the things that's being done is also being done by our organization, the Pew Charitable Trusts, um, to protect sharks by listing them on CITES. Um, so CITES is the Convention for the International Trade of Endangered Species, <coughs> um, and basically says that if a species is um, uh, threatened or endangered, it shouldn't be traded or it should be traded with under strict restrictions. And so um, our team uh, over there, they were meeting in Geneva the same last two weeks. <laughs> it's a busy <laughs> time for the oceans. <laughs> That's right, yes. um, uh, we're successful in getting uh, a whole bunch of new shark lists, uh, uh, shark species listed on um, CITES Appendix 2, which will do a, a lot to really help the shark populations. And shark mm -hmm. populations, as you may know, are a vital part of the ecosystem. Um, as top predators, they help to um, basically uh, they feed off of the weak and the, the sick fish and then make sure that the rest of the population, the rest of the fish stocks are healthy. Um, and those fish stocks contribute to the healthy marine environment. Mm -hmm. We've seen a marked decrease in the vast majority, just about every species on the planet, it seems like. Elephants, lions, giraffes, whatever. Uh, has the shark population deteriorated quite dramatically also? I guess with this finning taking place and perhaps some of the environmental disasters that are out there and what when the big boats go out and they scoop up all the fish and they don't want most of them, 90, maybe 80 percent of them they throw back in and then they can't live after being thrown back in the water. But how badly decimated is the shark population? Um, so I think uh, the shark, I mean, the shark populations are in peril, some of them more than others. Um, but yes, be just because of the threats you mentioned, um, there's a tremendous problem and decrease in shark populations globally. Um, and the ones that were listed on the, the studies appendix two are amongst the most um, at risk. And so we're really happy to see that. Mm -hmm. The world community has recognized that um, and will take action. I think there's a larger problem that, that we have here, though, is, is actually just the loss of biodiversity on the planet as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, there was a recent UN report that came out in May that showed um, that globally extinctions are on the rise. Um, and uh, and really, uh, I think whether it's on land or on sea, we're facing a critical moment, especially mm -hmm. as it exacerbated by the threats of climate change, um, to figure out how do we protect the marine biodiversity or the, the biodiversity of life on Earth um, for, for our own sustainability, for <laughs> to, <laughs> to make sure that we can uh, still thrive as people and communities that depend on, the, on those uh, natural solutions, um, but then also, um, you know, for future generations as well. And there's actually um, yet another UN process, um, uh, the UN Convention on Biodiversity, that's actually looking at what is um, a, uh, how to really address this crisis that's going on in biodiversity um, mm -hmm. from 20, for the next 10 years after 2020. And this is extremely important and we need to learn much more about it because uh, it's estimated now that we're losing 150 species of animal and plant species per day and we cannot, that's not sustainable, it's just absolutely unsustainable and we're going to have to really get serious about this and take climate change serious. The climate change crisis now is, uh, is even more of a threat than we thought it was before. Liz Karen, I want to thank you so very much yeah, for thank a you, very Bill. interesting and a very informative program. <laughs> thank you very much, thanks for having me. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.